So it's my great pleasure to introduce Douglas Bridges, who will speak on Shikara's contributions to constructive analysis. Please. Thank you. Well, you say it's rude to ask a lady her age, but it's certainly common to get <coughs> not to hide a man's age. So this talk was given in Kanazawa in March, to, really to celebrate Hajime Shikara's 60th birthday. And I want to, I'm actually going to break some rules in this talk, because I'm going to start off with a little bit of mathematics, actually show you how to prove something, and then I'm going to go on and talk about Hajime's contributions to foundational issues, and then at the end, stuff that many, if not most of you, won't be familiar with, some of his stirring work in analysis on our space theory. Okay, so the framework, of course, is bishop style mathematics, and I'm not going to dwell on that. We all know what that means after two, three months of the bond. And I am going to use dependent choice and hence countable choice. Okay, so the aim is to present these things here fundamental contributions by Hajime to both the analysis and, in fact, to some of the foundational issues as well. So, first part is Ishihara's tricks and BDM. And here is a result which I want to talk about from our very, very first paper together in, well, we started the work, we did the work in 1988. So let's remind, oh, actually this definition is probably not familiar to you. A linear mapping between normal spaces is well behaved if for each element of the space, if the element is distinct from, and that means a positive distance from here, every element of the kernel of T, the zero set space, the null space, then in fact the value of T is a positive distance from zero at X. Now of course this is very trivial to, to prove with Markov's principle because if the value of T at X was equal to zero then X would be in the kernel contradiction. But the, without Markov's principle we have to do some more work and we need to add an extra hypothesis. And it's easy to see that in fact, this result here as it stands, or the statement here as it stands, would in fact prove Markov's principle in the form that for every real number x, if x is non-zero, if it's impossible for x to be zero, then the absolute value of x is positive. And all you need to do here is to pick any real number x with the property that it's impossible for x to be equal to zero, and consider the mapping on the reals which takes a real number, sorry, any real number a. Consider the mapping which takes any real number x and multiplies it by a. That's a linear mapping. It's fairly easy to see that its kernel is zero. That comes from this assumption here. But we have one is not equal to zero and t of one is equal to a. So if, if uh, the, this principle up here held, if this was a well-behaved mapping, then we would be able to show that a is actually a positive distance from zero. Okay, so here's the first result that Hajime and I managed to prove together. If we have, if we introduce completeness into the range, then in fact we get well behaviorness or good behavior, however you want to, to put it. A linear mapping of a normal space onto a Banach space, a complete normal space, is well behaved. And the reason I want to do this is partly for historical fun, but also partly because it actually shows you how this lambda technique that Hajime elaborated on and smoothed out comes into play. So consider any element little x which is different from positive distance from each element of the kernel of our t. And we construct a binary sequence, and here we're going to be using choice or dependent choice. Construct a binary sequence such that if the sequence term, the nth term is 1, then the norm of tx is less than 1 over n squared, n of course being a positive integer. If lambda n is 0, then the norm of Tx is bigger than 1 over n plus 1 squared. And that's a comparison that we can make, of course, with the co-transitivity of the reals. And without loss of generality, we can assume that lambda 1 equals 1, because if it's equal to 0, then we're already finished. OK, if lambda n is 1, write Tn equal to 1 over n. And if lambda n plus 1 is equal to 1 minus lambda n, it's easy to see that this is a decreasing sequence. Once it hits a 0, it always has 0. If lambda n plus 1 is the flip over point from 1 to 0, set tk equal to 1 over n for all k greater than or equal to n. 
Then Tn is undoubtedly a Cauchy sequence in the reals and therefore has a limit T. On the other hand, if you haven't seen that abbreviation, that's what it stands for. On the other hand, the sum of lambda n times Tx easily, is easily seen to converge to a sum z in the Banach space, y, the range, because you just compare it with sigma 1 over n squared, the comparison test, essentially. So what you now do is let y equal x minus Tx. Omitting the details, you then show that Ty equals 0. So that means, clear is, if Ty is equal to 0, then x is different from y, because y is then in the kernel. And of course, Tz is x minus y, right? y was said equal to x minus tx. Tz is x minus y. x is, has the hypothetical property, and y is in the kernel. So that is a positive norm. And therefore, t is positive, and the norm of z is positive. Once you've done that, you just pick an integer, a positive integer, n, such that for all little n subsequent to big N, Tn is bigger than 1 over n. This is for T being positive. And therefore, Tn norm z is equal to n inverse norm z. If lambda at that big n plus 1 is equal to 1, then Tn plus 1 of the norm of z, which is equal to n plus 1 minus 1 norm of z, will be less than n minus 1 norm of z. But that's absurd, right? This is from the, the properties of the lambda. So this is equal to 1, then the T, Tn plus 1 is equal to 1 over n plus 1, so this thing here is equal to that, which is less than n inverse norm z, but n plus 1 is bigger than big N, and therefore Tn norm z is bigger than that thing here, we have a contradiction. Well, the only two possibilities are the lambda value is equal to 1, the lambda value is equal to 0. So we must have lambda n plus 1 equal to 0, and that means that the norm of Tx is bigger than 1 over n plus 1 whole squared. I'll run very quickly through that, but that is a typical of the sort of lambdas proof that you do in constructive analysis. It's, it's a relatively easier one, well, relatively elementary one, but it's typical of what you do. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's a, a parallel here, and I'm not going to prove That's the only one I'm ever going to prove. A subset of a metric space is located, you should know this, if the distance from x to s the infimum of the distance from x to y as y runs through x exists for each x in the space. And theorem 2, this is a kind of dual theorem to the first one, is if I have a linear mapping of a Banach space, so I put the completeness on the domain, if I have a linear mapping of a Banach space into a norm space, then consider B a subset of the graph of the mapping, that is closed and located in the Cartesian product x cross y. And let x comma y be any be a point of the Cartesian product such that y is different from tx. Then, in fact, the distance from x, y to the subset of the graph is bigger than zero. Of course, this is, right, this is just, um, I'm trying to say, yeah, y is not equal to tx. It immediately tells you in this theorem that x, y is distant from the graph. The proof of that theorem was actually due, due to Hajime entirely. I don't know whether it was the... No, it wasn't the first one he proved constructively, but it's certainly one of the good ones. And now, we know what strong extensionality is. It's that if the, if the two image values are a positive distance apart, remember this always means a positive distance apart in metric spaces, then the, in the points of the domain are a positive distance apart. And the corollary of that last result is that a linear mapping from a Banach space into a normal space is strongly extensional. And just note that for a linear mapping, strong extensionality is equivalent to this property here, that if Tx is a positive distance from zero, then for every z in the kernel, x is a positive distance from z. In other words, you've got a, a dual situation of the first theorem. The first theorem said that if you had this situation, then in fact Tx was positive distance from zero. All right, so that's the sort of stuff that we began our collaboration on, and that led in fairly short order 
to one of the most significant contributions to constructive analysis that's been done in the last goodness knows how many years, which are called Ishihara's tricks. And I should point out that like Wooden <coughs> Cardinals, Ishihara's tricks are not named by the author of the trick or the cardinal. In fact, the name is due to Dirk van Dalen. Now, here's the, of course, you, most of you will know this, but it's worth just get going through it again quickly. If I have a strongly extensional mapping from a complete space, metric space, into a metric space, and I have a sequence xn in the domain that converges to a limit x, and of course, the, right, okay, sorry, then for all positive alpha and beta with alpha less than beta, either the distance from fxn to fx is bigger than alpha for some n, or else the distance from fxn to fx is less than beta for all n. Now that was an astonishing surprise, I think, to anyone working in the area, that this clever use of completeness, and by the way, the use of completeness is through a good application of the lambda technique, this clever use of completeness enables you to make a decision which you would at first blush think was simply not possible constructively. Either the distance between the image of a term and the image of the limit is bigger than alpha for some n, or else the distance is less than beta for all n. And using that in a recursive fashion, again with clever use of the lambda technique, the second trick is produced. That if you have a strongly extensional mapping of a complete metric space into a metric space Y, you've got a sequence in the domain converging to a limit, <coughs> and here's the, the magic part, as it were. For all positive alpha less than beta with alpha, alpha and beta with alpha less than beta, either the distance from the nth image term to the image of X is bigger than alpha infinitely often, or else the distance is less than beta for all sufficiently large n. So in fact, you, with this, you, you appear to be getting, well, you have an alternative, but one of the parts of the alternative is showing or indicating that well, it looks like the image sequence converges. To, it looks like the image sequence converges to the image of the limit. Of course, you have to do a bit more work here, because this is for any alpha and beta with this property, and you've got to choose things carefully. And this trick is used again and again in constructive analysis. And of course, what you want to do, typically it's used when you want to get this conclusion for beta equal to a positive epsilon. And so you'll compare epsilon with epsilon over 2 and get this alternative through the trick and then do something to try and get rid of the first part of the alternative. OK, just to remind you, I'm sure you know these things, but sequential continuity the, if the sequence converges to a limit, the image of the sequence converges to the image of the limit. And sequentially non-discontinuous says that if xn converges to x, and for all n, the distance from fxn to fx is greater than or equal to delta, that forces delta to be less than or equal to zero. Clearly, sequential continuity implies sequential non-discontinuity, and of course, yeah, th these are obvious meanings when you don't just do it at the point, but you do it over a space. A consequence of the tricks is that the mapping of a complete metric space into a metric space is sequentially continuous, if and only if it's both sequentially non-discontinuous, this very weak continuity property, and is strongly extensional. So the completeness, Ishihara's trick, have given us the equivalence of a stronger continuity property in the presence of strong extensionality. A real number is said to be pseudo-positive if for the real number A, here we are, the real number A is pseudo-positive if for any real number X such that not not zero is less, we have the alternative not not zero is less than X or not not zero X is less than A. And the weak Markov principle says that every pseudo-positive number is positive, and of course is the consequence of Markov's principle. Then we have these equivalencies due to, again, due to Hajime. Every mapping of a complete metric space into a metric space is strongly extensional. 
If we sequentially non-discontinuous mapping of a complete metric space into a metric space is sequentially continuous, this very weak property getting sequential continuity, and the weak Markov principle. All this, when I say it falls out of Vishy-Harris tricks, you still have to do some work <coughs> for this, but it's good consequences of the tricks. And how do we prove that a, a simple form, a form of the Krasil de Combe Schoenfeld Satan theorem, and it's it's a really nice way to prove it because you don't have to do all the elaborate stuff that's typically done in recursion theory. Under the Church Markov Turing thesis, we have these equivalences. Every mapping of a complete metric space into a metric space is sequentially continuous. That's why it's a it's a slightly weaker form of the Kreisel etc. theorem. Weak Markov's principle, and the original. Kreisel, Kreisel and so on theorem deletes the sequentially from here and the weak from here. Okay, but you've got a very, very nice, slightly weaker form of that KL ST theorem established by much more simple means than anything I'd ever come across. And now, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you know what the limited principle of mis omniscience is without the formality. It says if I have a binary, any binary sequence, then I can decide whether all the terms are zero or there exists, meaning I can compute a term equal to one. Ishihara's third trick, and I think actually I'm the person who labeled it the third trick, because we, we didn't really do this one in the original paper with Dirk van Dalen and so on, and he certainly didn't, although he brought it in later. If we have a strongly extensional mapping from a complete metric space into a metric space, and the sequence converges to a limit x, and alpha bigger than zero, then in fact, the alternative that you don't want implies the limited principle of omniscience. And this is the key to ruling out that alternative in many, many applications. What you do is you want to show that the sequence f of xn converges to f of x. You apply Ishihara's tricks, and for any, I'm uh, um, sorry, but, um, with alpha equal to epsilon over 2, you apply the Shinara strict. And of course, you get that either this is true or the thing you want, the distance from fxn to fx is less than epsilon for all sufficiently large n. Well, then you use this third trick, <coughs> and you, then you know that if this hypothesis holds, you get LPO. And then you work with Bishop plus LPO to get a contradiction to rule out this hypothesis. And it's, it's really very, very neat indeed. And Hajime, I think you introduced this in a later paper. You didn't call it that, of course. But, yeah. Um, okay, so here's, here's what I've just said. A not uncommon situation, strongly extensional mapping from a complete metric space to a metric space, a sequence in X converging to a limit in a positive epsilon. You want to prove this inequality here. What you do is you have either the, this alternative or that one, and you use the third trick to derive LPO, and then you use LPO added to Bishop to get rid of the third trick, the, the third, uh, sorry, the first alternative. And yes, I think this is the case that the first example was in, in Hajime's proof of the constructive Banach inverse mapping theorem from functional analysis. If you have a one-to-one -one sequentially continuous linear mapping from a separable Banach space onto a Banach space, then the inverse is sequentially continuous. Of course, classically, you would have, uh, th this would be equivalent to continuous and continuous in both places. Okay, so I'm going to discuss why we can't delete sequentially from this theorem a little bit later, but I think actually I'm going to, I'm going to move on to that rather than do this. Okay, so this brings up Hajime's second big, again, tremendous insight really, to extract this seat, this property BDN, and I'm sure we know, but just in case, remind yourselves a subset of the natural numbers is pseudo-bounded, I guess it should be the positive integers, if the limit is n tends to infinity of a n over n is zero for every sequence a n in the set capital A. A principle of countable boundedness from Hajime is BDN. Every inhabited countable pseudo-bounded subset of the positive integers is bounded. And it's certainly true. It's derivable using excluded middle. 
Paginary showed that it's derivable with the church mark of Turing thesis and Markov's principle, and it's derivable using Brouwer's continuity principles. So it holds intuitionistically. So it holds in the three varieties of, or not varieties exactly, the three models or interpretations, if you like, the standard ones of Bishop's analysis. That is classical mathematics, intuitionistic mathematics, and recursive constructive mathematics. But Peter Leitz was the first person to show that you cannot derive it in unadulterated Bishop's constructive mathematics. In fact, what that means is that a theorem of the type Bish, standing for Bishop's mathematics, from with Bish you can derive P implies BDN, proves the impossibility of ever finding a proof in Bish of the statement P. Okay, so now I, I've called these things Ishihara's links, and I'd like to see it become a, a standard piece of terminology, but let's we'll see. Ishihara's link number one. If I have an inhabited pseudo-bounded subset of the positive integers, then there exists, first of all, a complete subset of the reals, secondly, a sequentially <coughs> continuous mapping from that subset to the binary values, to two, such that zero belongs to x, f of zero is zero, and for all m, if m belongs to the set A, the original set A, then 2 to the minus m is in x, and f of 2 to the minus m is equal to 1. And you can see that you're sort of setting up something that looks like a discontinuity at 0. If also A is countable, then x is actually a separable metric space, this complete subset here. That's the first link. The second link is, a, again, a sort of dual. If I have dual, not dual, if I have a sequentially continuous mapping from a metric space into a metric space, for each x and x and positive epsilon, I can find an inhabited pseudo-bounded subset of the positive integers with this property here, that for all positive integers, if there exists an x prime and x with the distance from x to x prime less than 1 over m, and the distance from fx to fx prime bigger than epsilon, then m belongs to A. If also x is separable, then A is countable. Now these are quite hard to digest, so I don't think we should dwell on that. What you're doing in the first one is starting with an inhabited pseudo-bounded subset of the positive integers, and you're constructing a certain complete x subset of the reals and a certain sequentially continuous mapping which has the potential to be discontinuous at zero and if the set A is countable then X is separable. And the second one is a kind of dual to that which we, we won't dwell on. Well, the following are equivalent statements over Bish, over Bishop's constructive mathematics, and again this is Hatchiman's work, every sequentially continuous mapping of a separable metric space into a metric space is continuous. Every sequentially continuous mapping of a complete separable metric space into a metric space is continuous. In the first case, we have no completeness. The second, we have. And the third thing is BEM. Now, from a didactic, didactic point of view, that's actually, actually a rather interesting result. Because, of course, when you teach a first course in analysis of and you prove the theorem that sequential continuity implies continuity, what do you do? You say, well, Suppose not, you've got a continuous function and so on, and you get a contradiction. So I've never seen any other proof of that in the undergraduate courses. But in fact, Hadjimi shows that you don't need to do that. You don't need full excluded middle, you just need BDN. Okay, I, I'll ignore the proof, I think, as well. Well, okay, let me quickly, very quickly sketch through this for the analysts of whom there are a few here. Well, let's start with an inhabited countable pseudo-bounded subset of the positive integers. By the first link, we can get a complete separable x in the reals, our sequentially continuous binary value mapping on x. Zero is an x, f of zero is zero, and for any m, m is in the inhabited, etc., pseudo-bounded set, from, implies two to the minus n belongs to x, and f of two to the minus n equals one. And you can sort of see what's going to happen here, I think, because you're going to well, okay, let me... You're going to assume that, that this function is sequentially continuous and you're going to force this to be impossible for a large enough n. Okay, so assuming the 
2, which is that every sequentially continuous map on a metric space is, actually on a complete metric space, is, um, is continuous, sorry. Then we can find a positive big M such that if X is an X and the absolute value of X is less than 2 to the minus N, then the absolute value of F of X is close enough to F of 0, which is 0, remember, such that the absolute value of F of X is less than 1. Okay, so let's consider M and A and suppose that M is greater than or equal to this big M. Then 2 to the minus M belongs to X and F of 2 to the minus M equals 1 and 2 to the minus M is less than 2 to the minus big M which means that f of 2 to the minus m is less than 1, and yet according to this, it's equal to 1. So we get a contradiction, and hence m is less than or equal to m for all m and a, and there's the boundedness from the original pseudo-boundedness. It's a very nice little argument. A lot of ingenuity to, to come up with the idea. And for the third part, we'll we use the, the second link. Here's a few examples of statements that are equivalent to BDM over BISH and therefore derivable classically, intuitionistically, and recursively. <coughs> First one is our every one-to-one -one bounded linear mapping of a separable Banach space onto a Banach space has continuous inverse. That's, so this is the, the continuity, the full-blooded Banach inverse mapping theorem with bounded or continuous instead of Hajime's version of sequential continuous. So he showed, this was subsequent to the original paper, the links, Hajime showed the classical version of the inverse mapping theorem in functional analysis is equivalent to BDN. If T is a non-zero bounded linear mapping, that means it has a positive value in some vector of a separable Hilbert space into itself, such that the adjoint exists and the range is complete, then T is an open mapping. It maps open sets to open sets. So this is a version of the open mapping theorem for Hilbert spaces. And notice I've said such that T star exists because the proposition that every bounded operator on a Hilbert space has a nitroid, that proposition implies the limited principle of omniscience. And third, a third consequence of BDM, or equivalent to BDM, every one-to-one -one self adjoint sequentially continuous linear mapping from a Hilbert space onto itself is bounded. Okay. Now here's a, a slightly different thing which comes a little bit later. Again, there's joint work involved in, in this. A mapping from metrics between metric spaces is uniformly sequentially continuous if when I have any two sequences in the domain with the property that the distance between their nth terms goes to zero then the distance between the nth image terms goes to zero as well. This came up in thinking about the uniform continuity theorem, and it's pretty clearly, I think, an analog, a uniform analog of the sequential continuity. So here's a couple of equivalents of BDN. Every uniformly sequentially continuous mapping of a complete separable metric space into a metric space is uniformly continuous. And every uniformly sequentially continuous mapping of a complete separable met metric space into a metric space is pointwise continuous. So in fact, BDN is equivalent not just to the uniform continuity uh, here from uniform sequential continuity, but the, it's equivalent to here, it's equivalent to the pointwise continuity. So if you want to get pointwise continuity under this hypothesis, well, you're in fact going to get BDN and therefore you're going to get uniform continuity. All right. I want to, to talk now, I think this talk's going to be a bit shorter than I expected, but that's all right. I want to talk about Hajime's contributions to functional analysis. The earliest contributions, I think, were his work on the Hanbach and the separation theorems, which was also part of his thesis. So let's remind the people for whom this is less familiar. A linear functional on, oops, sorry. Uh, a linear functional on a norm space is normable, or as I prefer to call it, normed, 
if the norm of you, the usual thing, the supreme norm of my missed somehow or other missed out the other normal symbol here, the supreme norm of the norm of u of x such that x is in x and the norm of x is in the, is like the one, the supreme norm of the values of u of x over the unit ball exists. A non-zero, Bishop proved that a non-zero bounded linear function on the norm space is normable if and only if its kernel is located. That's, it's not difficult, it's a neat little result. And it's the kind of result, of course, that the classical analysts wouldn't even think about because locatedness is uh, irrelevant to classical analysis. Bishop's version of the Han Banner theorem says that if I have a non-zero bounded linear functional on a linear subset of a separable norm space, with the property that the kernel of the functional is located not just in here, in the subspace, but in the entire space X, then for each positive epsilon, I can find a normable linear functional on X, such that the functional coincides with V on big Y, and the norm of U is increased from the norm on Y only by at most an amount less than epsilon. But it's not exact. Usually, the node no, uh, no space is uh, uh, located in, uh, in, in Y, in the subset. Kernel of V is located in X. Is it in X? It's in X, yes, that's, uh, that's crucial, because otherwise you wouldn't, you, this U, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that, I think. You wouldn't uh, get the locatedness in X. Uh, um, in fact, there's an example of Makiri's Mesquite is shore on the road, which shows that you can't beat that in general. You can't get rid of the excellent in general. It's a recursive example. So Hajime's paper on this was the following. He observed that things change if you make some conditions on the norm. So you have a norm space, you'd say that the norm is Gato differentiable if this fairly obvious kind of limit exists. Norm of x plus t by minus the norm of y over t exists for, the limit as t tends to zero, exists for all unit vectors in the space. And we say that, the, the, separately we say that the space is uniformly convex if for each positive epsilon there's a delta such that if I take any two unit vectors where their midpoint is bigger than one minus delta, then the distance between the vectors is less than epsilon. All you're saying here is you've got an x and y and half the, the um, their unit vectors x and y and the midpoint has a norm bigger than one, uh, one minus delta, sorry, so the, the midpoint is very close to the boundary, then in fact x must be very close to y. So Hajime's theorem is this, if I have a uniformly convex binary space and the norm is Gato differentiable, and I have a non-zero normable linear functional on any linear subspace y, then in fact there exists a unique normable linear functional on X, which coincides with V on Y, and whose norm is equal to the norm of V. In the context of uniformly con continuous Banach spaces with Gato differentiable norm, Hajime also removed the epsilon from the conclusion of Bishop's separation theorem, which is pretty well the equivalent of the Han Banach theorem. And in particular, of course, these results apply to Hilbert spaces. So we know that you've got an exact Hilbert space, an exact version of the han banach theorem on a Hilbert space. <clears throat> now this is work which Hajime and others have done, not me actually at all, on locating subsets of Hilbert spaces and then of Banach spaces. And this is, I think the proofs are really deep applications, technically tricky applications, and very ingenious, of the lambda technique, the Ishihara tricks and so on. So here's the first of these theorems. If I have an inhabited bounded convex subset of an inner product space, not, no completeness, inhabited, bounded, and convex, then this set is located if and only if the supremum of the real part of x inner product v as v runs through big X exists for each element x in big X. And that should be v in x and c, should, it? should be in c here. No, no, not right. Oh, C. C, yeah, that should be C. That's a misprint. Yeah. yeah. So C is located if and only if when you take the real part of x comma v as v runs through C, and you take the supremum the, the supremum of that exists for any x, then in fact C is located and vice versa. 
Now, of course, remember, this is, this is purely constructive analysis. No classical mathematician would even think about looking at this sort of problem, because locatedness is trivial there. And remarkably, when x is a Hilbert space, Hajime was able to show that the bounded hypothesis is unnecessary on this thing. Ishihara's proof uses a very, very ingenious Landa's argument. It's non-trivial. As a consequence of that, Hajime was able to prove this thing. Remember I said before that, that you can't say that every operator, every bounded operator in Hilbert space has an adjoint. That would imply LPO. But if you have an operator with an adjoint on a Hilbert space, then the image under, the, under this operator of the unit ball is located. Again, a purely constructed result. The existence of the adjoint implies the locatedness of the unit ball. And notice the operator wasn't seen to be bounded here. It's just an operator. But taken with a prior result of Fred Richman, we have this really nice conclusion. A bounded operator on a Hilbert space has an adjoint if and only if it maps the unit ball onto a located set. It's a very nice thing, a criterion for adjoint existence in a Hilbert space. <clears throat> now, this brings on to the next thing, is getting out of the Hilbert space con context and getting into something more general, the Banach space context. So let's give some definitions here. A norm space is smooth if it is if its norm is gamma differentiable at each non-zero vector, that is, this limit we had before exists for all unit vectors x and y. It's uniformly smooth if it's smooth, and for each positive epsilon, there's a delta such that the difference between this thing here and the limit there and the, the quotient term here is less than epsilon whenever you've got unit vectors and t is in absolute value, positive and less than delta. So it's just a uniform version of the smoothness technique, the property. Don't try to digest that too much. It's fairly natural, but the point is the results, really. So we'll denote the dual of a norm space by x star, the space of bounded linear functionals, so that the linear space of all bounded linear functionals in x. In the infinite dimensional case, the normability of every bounded linear functional implies LPO. So we can't describe this as a norm space in the usual classical way. We say that a norm space has uniformly convex dual if, so this is just getting a definition of uniform con convexity which avoids using the norm and the dual. So uniformly complex dual, for each epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta between zero and one, such that for all normed elements of the dual, with norms equal to one, there exists a z, um, if, there exists a z, sorry, there exists a z which is a unit vector, and has the property that a half u plus v, the value of the functional, z is bigger than one minus delta, and this implies for all x, the norm of x equal to 1 implies u minus v of x is less than epsilon. So you see, this is, this is basically getting this hypothesis. It's getting around the fact that you don't have a norm, but it's kind of copying out and making something classically equivalent to it. OK, so a lot of technical complexities lead to and lead through the proof of this and other important results in the paper. Here's the, the first one. A separable norm space is uniformly smooth if and only if it has a uniformly convex dual. Now, that, that would be classically known, but its, it's uh, constructive proof is very, very tricky. In the paper, the two authors extend and generalize a lot of Hajime's earlier work in locatedness in Hilbert spaces. And here's a sample theorem, simply. You can see that it's a, a generalization, because here I'm going to be taking the values of a linear functional. And of course, a linear functional on the Hilbert space is an inner product with a particular vector. So the criterion we had for Hilbert space naturally lifts up here. Or equivalently, this, for a Hilbert space, reduces to the original criterion. So what is it? Uniformly convex, uniformly smooth, by my space. 
C is an inhabited bounded convex subset of X, then C is located if and only if the supremum of F of Y as Y runs through C exists for each normed element F of X star. So as long as you're dealing with normed elements, and they're dense anyway, you are you're able to, to handle this thing rather nicely. So we have a criterion for locating this in the context of uniformly convex, uniformly smooth Banach spaces. And the, the sets that we show are located are inhabited bounded convex subsets, provided this condition works. Of course, Hilbert spaces are uniformly convex and they're uniformly smooth. And in view of this and the Reese representation theorem about functionals being inner products, essentially, then this is a theorem eight, or oops, sorry, our original theorem on Hilbert space is a special case of this one here. I want to finish by talking about the last joint paper that Hanjami and I and Martin Cooper Jordans did, which is on the theorem about uniformly convex Banach spaces and reflexivity. Now remember I said that the dual is not a norm space in the infinite dimensional context. It's an example of what we call a quasi-norm space. I won't go into the details of that, but there's a theorem of normability that corresponds to the existence of the usual classical norm. In turn, the linear space X double star, the bounded linear functionals on the dual, so this is the second dual, is a quasi-norm space as well. And classically, the notion of a quasi-norm is essentially equivalent to that of a norm. So all I'm saying here is that there is a way of getting around the non-normability in the infinite dimensional situation with these quasi-norms, which classically reduce the norms. A non-linear space is reflexive if for each normed element of its second dual, there is a necessarily unique element of the original space such that the normed element big F is equal to x hat, where x hat of u is u of x for each u in the dual. So x hat is acting on elements of the dual space, and u, of course, is in the dual space and is acting on elements of x. There's a classical theorem, due to Milman and Pettis, it's quite an old theorem, saying that a uniformly convex Banach space is reflexive, and this mapping x to x hat is a norm-preserving bijection. Well, can we lift that in some way into the constructive context, knowing that we don't have the norm in general on the jewels? We have a general counterpart, and I'm not describing it in detail here, but it applies to complete pliant, I'll come back to that in a second, uniformly convex quasi-norm spaces. Pliant is a condition that we introduced I won't talk about it in general. It holds trivially for all norm spaces. So we've not introduced something that weakens the hypotheses from the classical version. Constructively, a separable norm space is pliant, as is a norm space with gutto differentiable norm. So from the general theorem, we have a general theorem, and we obtain the special case, a uniformly convex Banach space is reflexive under either of these conditions. It is separable or it has a Gatto differentiable norm. In particular, a Hilbert space is reflexive, but that's essentially a consequence, of course, of the Reese representation theorem for bounded linear functionals. So this is a consequence of our general theorem, uniformly convex Banach space. The general theorem deals with quasi-normed spaces. Okay, so the conclusion. Well, the conclusion is that this is by no means a full range of the work that Hajime has done. You can leave the room now, actually. <laughs> it makes no, ex no explanation whatsoever, explicitly, no mention of his work on constructive reverse mathematics, of which there is an arguable argument that he, Richmond, Julian, and Feldman are the founders. <coughs> and his exp exploitation of BDN in that constructive reserve Mathematics is just a beginning, or reverse mathematics, is just a beginning of what he's really done. And it certainly makes no mention of his contributions to constructive topology, for example, formal, apartment spaces, formal topology, functional spaces, and many other areas. And 
to his embarrassment, I, I will actually make this comment. It surely does is presents the work of a remarkably insightful, technically extremely strong constructive analyst. And I'll just finish with the last bit as well. Oh, well, no, not that bit, but many happy returns. Again, 